don't even worry about angles anymore. Alright. So, for this lesson, it's probably a good idea if you can access the class lesson. So, I'll give you a couple of minutes to make sure that you are able to do that. I would suggest that you immediately download all that I've placed on here. I have put here um, Joseph Conrad and the Heart of Darkness background. There's some background notes there for you. Exposition of the Heart of Darkness and Heart of Darkness Men Without Women. Men Without Women, reading that is your homework. I am going to pull the homework class up. you got to give it to me Monday. Hey, he's been hanging on to that homework class since last year. I'm impressed. You can. I'm happy to get that homework class out of you. Would it? Yeah. Particularly since it's followed up by a quiz. So do download those now, please. Um, I deliberately chosen them. You'll notice that Moodle is growing every day with more things. And, but I'm sort of like choosing things that I think will be particularly useful. The Men Without Women one, the gendered reading will be next term, sorry not next term you wish, uh, next week. Whereas we are of course looking uh, at the context of the novel today. Now we're also towards the end of the lesson going to be looking at the exposition and we'll be looking at the attitudes that are coming through. You will recognize some of them because this is a late 19th century, extraordinarily early 20th century text. I would actually consider it a late eight, nine, yeah, sorry, or late 19th century text just because it's about, I think it came out in 1898, is that correct? Could you check your books please? Never just trust me. I've only had three of these today. I'm barely awake. 1899. See, I missed. By one year. All right. What do you know about Joseph Conrad? <laughs> had a breakdown. Okay. I was being more general. Uh, what nationality or ethnicity is he? Uh, I get, some people say Polish, some people say Ukrainian, so he is definitely uh, European. He is not English, but at the time of writing this book, what was he? English. No, he was in England trying to become a citizen. Is that what you said? Yeah. So, that's actually quite interesting in terms of some of the framing choices that he has made. He has chosen to tell it through Marlowe, who is not English, looking at the impact of colonisation on Europeans through someone who is not English. So we get this situation where you look at the British example of slavery as being somehow more humane. And the other forms, the Dutch forms, Belgium. I think it's King Leopold who's in control of at that time. And which country is that? Belgium. Belgium. So Belgium. King Leopold is in control of the Congo at that point. So we can actually attribute a slight amount of um, an agenda there. The idea of you know not examine, not confronting his English readers with their own atrocities, but they're having a certain amount of safety, a certain amount of, of removal from the situation where their one is their version of occupation of Africa is seen as more humane, more organized compared to the Belgian experience in the Congo. And I don't think it can be denied that the Congo um, had the, 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 the version of occupation that went there, the version of invasion, was particularly horrific. Something I have seen numbers like 50% of people died, things like that. It's it's huge. Of course, we understand now from a post-colonial reading perspective that there is an agenda to suggesting that 
there is a worse version and that there is a better version. It, that ultimately still justifies the um, grab for Africa. Do you know what the grab for Africa is? Or the, 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 what was it called? It was called the scramble for Africa. Pretty much um, all of the European nations, or West European nations, yep. so I should clarify, uh, not all, but most, wanted um, like stakes in Africa. So we had, um, you know, large, almost, yeah. pretty much all of Africa was... There were two by. places that weren't. Do you know what they were? No, Ethiopia was... Ethiopia was one, there was another. Well, no, no, that was claimed in the 1930s by Italy. Oh, yes, but we're talking about it this time. There was only two patches of the map that weren't. Ethiopia and one other place. Which one? Eritrea. Go look it up. You got these computers in front of you. And then you're going to see something very horrifying. There are only two countries in the entirety of Africa that was owned by Africans. Ethiopia and Liberia. And Liberia. Also, while you're on the map, I want you to have a look at the Congo. Notice how that it's got this tiny little sliver going towards the sea, and the rest of it is. It's in the heart of Africa. Everyone have a groan. Everyone look at the title of the book and groan a little. <laughs> you don't get it. You're so sweet, innocent, and naive. Stay that way. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, we have this 19th century man. European and English, essentially, in terms of his culture, his ethnicity. What was his initial career? Which one? Who? Who? Yeah. I don't know what you're saying. I don't know what you're saying. Oh, we'll just stare at each other. <laughs> <laughs> Have you just found out what I'm speaking about there, Sarah? What was his initial? Um, He's right in the middle, yes? Yeah? In the heart. Yep. He, um, he worked for shippers, uh, sent him to the French. Antilles? Yes. Yeah, he, he actually was a shipman. Yeah, he worked on a ship. Seafarer. Seafarer. Mm. So he actually was a sailor. Mm. Yes. No, that's him. That's Joseph Conrad. He actually did that. Okay. Yeah. That was my question. Who are we talking about? Oh, Joseph Conrad. Yeah. Mm. yeah. I've also put his little, a happy little picture up there. There you go. Yeah. You're not going to like him more by the end. Okay. Now, as a 19th century person, his perspective and the way he represented, because always his representation will be coloured by that. So he still has this idea of Africans, while he does actually have some sympathy for them and their experience as being colonised, um, he actually said, I'm going to absolutely destroy this quote, I'm so sorry, that just because people in different you know, in a different place, have flatter noses than we do, doesn't mean that they don't have rights, you know, that they don't have feelings, that we should treat them worse. So he was aware of the idea. I'm so sorry, I have to keep everything on so that we don't get COVID. Imagine how it's going to get as it gets colder. Yeah. I might buy blankets. I'm actually not kidding. All right. I'm so sorry. Anyway, focus back. Try not to freeze to death. All right. So as I was saying, he does create this binary, um, whereas the you know the European culture has the um, overarching structures that connect people with their morality, connect people with their sanity, and he puts that very firmly in the white European tradition. It's that. Whereas the Africans are seen as elemental figures, ones that are close to nature, part of nature, perhaps almost like spiritual creatures, not as in connected to God, but almost like a, um, like demons at times. There are some things where he actually describes them almost in a demonic way. There's only really one or two positively represented African people, and positively is a very, very suspect term here. There is the, um, the shipmate that he has that dies. 
and then there is the African woman who he represents as being strong and powerful as she stands on the shore watching you know, the boat pull away with Kurt. But even in that case, the way she drifts back into the, into the, the woods and things, she is an elemental creature. She is still savage, even though she is strong. And of course, there's another binary then connecting um, the Africa. He loves his binaries, by the way, like the British colonialism and the Belgian colonialism. And, you know, here we've got um, the, the, the effect of England or Belgium and the effect of Africa on Europeans. Because that's what he's really looking at, not so much the experience of black people in Africa. And the other one that is there is the binary between the women of Belgium and the women of Africa. So the intended of Kurt, for instance, is quite ridiculous to us in some ways. And I don't, I must admit, I take an alternative, in fact, even resistant reading of her. We'll discuss that more next week. But she is passively waiting forever for Kurt to come home. And that is actually seen as something admirable her staunch loyalty to her intended, to her fiance, her beauty, which is focuses on her pale skin and her white hair. Yes, uh, his her, the fiance, yeah. I have a slightly different reading um, also of what he did at the end where it was supposedly a kindness for him to lie to her and say, that Kurtz's last words were her name. Um, I can't help thinking as a contemporary woman that the truth would have set her free. Because what's she going to do now for the rest of her life? Mourn him. And somehow that's good. I do not know how. Of course, she is a fictional character and I am becoming emotionally inco involved with something that does not exist. Something to remember. Who here has ever mourned a fictional character more than perhaps anyone else in their life? All right, we're, counting, we're not counting immediate family. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Shh. All right. So, now, context of uh, Heart of Darkness doesn't just stop at the publication of the book because there has been movements throughout history since then. we well, probably call it history, but it's only 100 years is a little bit cheeky of me. This book, some people don't believe we should study it. And one of those people is Hannah. Um, why? Why? <laughs> why should we not study it? Are we going to? You don't get that choice. I'm terribly sorry if I've offered that to you and it was just an illusion. Why shouldn't we, wa we watch it? Why shouldn't we? Is it a direct question? Sir? Yeah, it's a direct question. Why shouldn't we read this? Why should it be not canon? Canon is a book that we consider part of the necessities of reading in literature. What? Why we should read it? Why we shouldn't. <laughs> All right, stop for a minute. Imagine that you are Congolese. Imagine that you are actually from the Congo. Should we read this? It's racist. It's racist. It suggests that there is a good way to colonize and a bad way to colonize. It suggests that African people, people are evolutionary lesser. Um, it suggests that civilization is an entirely European intellectual space. It represents African people as childlike or brutal. And once again, it's placing the experience of an invasion um, within the perspective of a European seeking to find their fortune and fame. Once again, African people and their experience and their tragedy is just players, are just players within a white man's adventure.
that we're going to study it anyway because that's the kind of horrific people we are. And let's be further ironic, even if you write a reading that agrees with that, you as middle class Australian privileged people will be getting good marks based on a text written about the exploitation of Africa. Yay, participation. Who feels a little bit ugly now? Nobody? Oh, only no, Kai's happy. Kai, no. Oh, we are now all Kate Grenville stuck within this little dilemma of what we will do. Okay. <laughs> In protest, let's all not write the essay. Yeah, that'll go beautifully for you. I think it will. Yeah. Very poetic. Yeah. Don't worry, we're going to end the term with actually Samuel Wagon Watson. But it's okay. Samuel Wagon Watson is an Aboriginal Australian poet. And we get to try and redress some of the imbalance in literature as a course. Because it needs it really badly. <laughs> All right. I tried to buy some other books too, but uh, you can't buy them. Yes. There is another context that matters in terms of this. And what one do you think that might be, Little Colonisers? <laughs> As we all look at Africa and go bad. What might also be relevant for us to look at contextually? We could, but how about the fact that we're Australians living on Noongar land? Yes. Mm. Suddenly it's uncomfortable, Suddenly, isn't it? Yeah, it just yeah. Got, everything just got a bit colder. Got a bit closer. All right. So what do we know also about um, imperialism? What do we know about imperialism? They like doing things. What is the word? Our country better at the expense of everyone else. Yeah, we are. Um, what is the saying that the English had? Because remember, he's, even though he's writing with a character who is, um, who is golden, he's, his audience is English. It's in English. It starts off in England. Um, what, is, what is the empire to them? The sun never sets on the empire. The sun okay. never sets on the empire. Mm. Now, I want you to write down light and darkness, because that is actually a recurring motif. Because there's actually an irony to that. If there's always sunshine on your empire, that means there's also always... Darkness. Darkness. You do too. So do I. Though mine are usually very badly made. Like I like Tubi where you get the ones made by somebody's uncle in Canada with the booms showing. You know. I highly recommend those. Not to you though. Whoever's watching this, study. Alright. You all written that down? And of course the heart of darkness is also psychological. It's the darkness inside people. The darkness inside colonising the colonisation, sorry, and the darkness inside the capitalist exploitation of other countries. And you can look at the problematic use of the word dark and the idea of darkness and blackness at a later time. I think I've given you enough at this point. So what I'm going to get you to do is to look quietly through the notes you've taken for one minute. I'll take any questions. Is your hand up or are you stretching? I can't tell. Okay. Um, take a few moments, read through, and then we're going to do an activity. Any questions? Give me one minute. 